think that uh, this is the challenge is of just telling the truth in a way that people can understand and can process. And, uh, you know, people in the end are responsible for the quality of their own life to that extent, but we can do a lot to help. And I think what's been so amazing to me with this program is how you've been able to reach out to the community. You know, I, uh, I, it's not about having all the money in the world. It's not about, uh, you know, fancy titles. It's about how do you relate handshake to handshake? How do you relate to, and I think you said it so well tonight when you said no man touches any other man more intimately uh, and allows that uh, than your barber and even the hairstylist. And I think that that is such a, an important thing. But you know what I, I learned more than anything, and, and I gotta tell you, the night that I watched Dynamite talk about all of this <laughs> with his clients, and I gotta tell you, that was an education for me. You know, I like to think I've had some education. Well, I got an education that night and it was beautiful. It was wonderful mm -hmm. and it made a difference. And uh, so I think that one of the things you've taught us here is what we often don't teach. And that is you can have all the recommendations, all the policies, all the science, all of the things in the world. But if you can't get that needle that last inch, what have you accomplished? You can't turn a vaccine into a vaccination, and that's what you all are so good at. Um, yes, it's very important to sort of think about the spaces that black that that, that black men have and and have had. Um, but it seemed to be that we were missing a big picture um, um, on this space. And frankly, there had been no historical work, surprisingly, done on black barbershops. And so I thought there was a certainly um, um, an important story to tell. And so the, the story that I, that I do tell uh, goes from 1830 uh, to approximately the, the 1970s. Um, and essentially, it looks at the evolution of uh, the barbering profession uh, and also the barber shop, particularly um, black men's entry into the into those two spaces. Um, outlining, I'll be sort of brief here. Um, I'm an academic, so I like to talk. Yeah, yeah, be, yeah, um, academics and preachers are uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> very closely related. I'm telling you that. Go that's ahead. Right. That's right. So, so. Essentially, I thought what was missing was like barbers were ironically missing from our conversations on barbershops. Right. We talked about the barbershops and spaces, but we didn't talk a lot about the barbers, right? Uh, which I'll say in a second connects with, I think, the work that that, that um, uh, this project has been doing. Um, and so uh, the book is essentially sort of traces uh, the ways in which uh, black owned barbershops in the 19th century uh, were primarily sort of commercial spaces owned by black men, uh, but patronized by wealthy white businessmen and politicians. Um, between the between the 1880s and 19, 1920s, 1930s, um, a number of things happened that sort of pushed black barbershops from down from downtown business districts to particularly black neighborhoods. One, there was a, you know, the emergence of the uh, Barber's Union, uh, primarily uh, spearheaded by um, uh, German immigrant barbers uh, who didn't mind being barbers. Native white men didn't want to be barbers because they associated barbering with servile manual labor, uh, effeminate labor. So you talked about uh, uh, touching a man's face. Right. Well, you know, white men didn't want to be barbers because they thought that if I touch a man's face and I might be seen as an effeminate worker, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Which was certainly hogwash for sure. Um, but also during this, and so they they pushed for licensing laws. The licensing laws that that we see now uh, became about beginning in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, etc. Uh, at the same time, there were uh, a new generation of barbers who were born after the Civil War, came of age in the 1890s, right when Jim Crow uh, uh, was on the rise. Um, and they opened barbershops uh, 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 targeting Black patrons and Black communities. Um, and so I look at that shift, and then so at the point, right, that Black men are opening barbershops in Black communities, certainly they're segregated communities, but I like to talk about the com Black communities as more than segregated communities, right? There's a lot more happening than, than, yeah. than the segregation. Uh, but there's a, a larger sort of a willing congregation in these spaces. So they weren't in barbershops, 
because they couldn't go to white barbershops, they didn't want to. Uh, just going back to briefly what you were saying about our friend, we just lost a, a, a good friend. He was on, he was on the hell no wall. Um, he contracted COVID uh, on a, the week before we did our second vaccine clinic at the barbershop. He collect, he he contracted it on a Monday. He was hospitalized Thursday, and he died Saturday in a short week. Um, and he had no underlying conditions. I had nine kids, three grandkids in the prime of his life, enjoying the fruits of his labor and uh, was just stubborn about the shot, uh, took a position to say no. And um, it, he met his demise. It was it was, it was still kind of tough to talk about, but uh, it's just the reality of the, how serious the situation is. And it, it, it just makes me push the pedal to the metal harder to fight the hell no wall so people who were saying no i'm not getting vaccinated now now they're saying i'm uh one of my other customers i talked to uh his brother had contracted he was about to die he pulled through so now him and his brother they're talking about getting vaccinated so i don't like saying you need to do this i keep saying brother is here we have the information go on our website look up the research uh answer your own questions i mean i can't I can't tell you what it is that you're looking for. You know what you're looking for. So do the research, find what you're looking for to get the answers. But I have both shots and I'm boosted. So uh, I'm sitting here cutting your hair and I'm, I'm doing fine. No third arm is growing out of me or nothing. Mm -hmm. So just get on board and keep the world safe. I would say very briefly, consistency, trans, uh, transparent, intentional, supported, empowered. And I say that um, because, you know, first of all, we're on Facebook. So that's transparent. You know, the, the, the brother spoke on earlier, Chris, about what's being what's being said on the streets. I'm in the streets. I'm, I'm, my, I'm in one of the poorest neighborhoods in our city um, and born and raised in this community, in this neighborhood. And I hear exactly what- Tell you know, people the, where you are. Uh... I'm in Rochester, New York, uh, Rochester, New York. And uh, we, we have, um, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories. There's a lot of theories around there. Of course, they're going to use black doctors. Of course, they're going to use black people to infiltrate and, and come in and, and, and extract the knowledge from us and find our weaknesses and study us and do it. But I, I push back on that only for the reason of uh, it's not this is not something that's happening in, behind closed doors. This is not something that um, in my opinion, the table isn't open for anybody who wants to be a part of it and wants to be a part of the discussion. Oftentimes, as one of the sisters said, you know, they come in, they bring stuff into our barbershop, the, a pamphlet, they want to research us. Wanna, I mean, some of them I've even seen the local hospitals where they're paying people to go into these different uh, research projects and, and things of that nature. But we're never at the table to be a part of the conversation. We're never uh, being intentional to to get pushback on what we think and what we feel. I think I heard somebody say, you know, how are you going to research us without us, right? So I, in, in the work that I do, you know, in, in the politics, you know, that's very important to bring people to the community. The people that are being impacted and marginalized have to be the ones who are at the table helping to make the decision and be willing to be intentional about receiving that pushback. I've never seen Dr. T and Mayor O'Neill be uh, 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 not wanting to take that pushback and, and not wanting to hear the truth on how people feel and always asking us, how do we feel? We're not forcing anybody to get anything. We're not holding people down in chairs and sticking needles in their <laughs> arm, you know? So so we're, we're giving them information and, we're, and this is bigger than vaccines. It's bigger uh, when we're talking about healthcare and information, people perish for the lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I've always seen that the empowerment piece of barbers and beauticians and appearance enhancement professionals, understanding the power that we have internationally, we can control the world. Well, there's a lot of information that has to be shared. And uh, that's basically what I'm saying is, uh, we're, we're as, as uh, barbershops, we have to have continuous information. 
continue this conversation because uh, we'll be now I'm not a barber but I have shops but uh, I've talked to my barbers and they'll say they'll have a point that they're trying to make to anybody but they have to make it to everybody mm-hmm. uh, you have a person that's in the chair for 20 minutes half an hour and whether or not they get their point across to that individual they start the conversation again with the next individual Mm -hmm. And it goes on, and we were talking about this the last time, where training is one of those things where it has to be repeated. You can't get, you can't think that uh, your dog is going to get trained because you give him one treat. You can't think a person is going to learn because you told him one time. It's going to take two or three times, and I think the uh, the natural number is seven, where they have to get it seven times before they say, "Oh, wait a minute, I know that." (laughs) 